who knew where I was. What? Okay. We're open. We're, we're recording. Is Michelle That's attending this meeting? Does anyone know? I have seen nothing. Okay. Here another. Let me. I will text. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she mentioned having sent an email to Joel, uh, she, but I didn't she see said, it. She said I tried to get in on my phone, and it said link was invalid. She said she'll be here a little late. Uh, so Athena, maybe you want to text her another or try to get her another link. And you could you throw up the virtual thing that I'm supposed to read? I apologize. I usually have it on paper, but I don't have all my notes with me right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So seeing a presence of the quorum, um, I'm going to call the, the uh, July 19th meeting of the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee to order and pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapter 22, and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. I'm going to call on each counselor now to find out if they are present and can hear and be heard. Uh, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Uh, Mandy Johanneke. Present. And Jennifer Taub. Present. Yeah. And Michelle Miller will be late uh, to this morning's meeting. Um, Thank you. Uh, we've had a, a change of agenda. Uh, Mandy, Joe, and I are uh, going to be, we need to review very carefully uh, KP Law's uh, information. And so we'll be bringing this back at another time, but we will not be looking at the zoning proposal today. But I want to remind everybody on the committee and if there are members of the public that GOL does not deal with substantive issues. So contrary to some of the comments we've received, voting today on anything that we look at will be about clearness, consistency, and actionability, and only those things. We are occasionally asked by the council to look at substantively at cert like certainly the bylaws that have been up for review. Uh, but that is a special request of the council and has nothing to do with the zoning proposal or anything else on our agenda today. So that being said, Jennifer, I want to thank you for coming forward uh, and um, being willing to chair the part of the meeting on zoning. Uh, I appreciate any preparation that you may have had to do to do that. Yes, Jennifer. Yes, yeah, so I actually... I don't know if it's appropriate to ask it now, but I do have a question because some of the, you know, so I appreciate that the sponsors are going to go back and, you know, review carefully the KP law comments, but if the ones that did get to substance, does it have to go back to CRC before it comes back to G? I mean, if you make changes that are substantive, can it come right to GOL or does it have to go back to CRC? That's my I question. I believe, and I'm, there are two people here who may be able to uh, embellish or correct, that if the sponsors make a substantive change during the GOL meeting, that is acceptable. Um, so if, um, in, if we have a resolution and there's no sponsor, particular sponsor present, we might have to go back. We can't make a substantive change, even if there's a specific error. Uh, but if the sponsors or sponsor is there, then we can ask their opinion. Um, we, it's hard sometimes not to bring up a substantive issue, but it is not what we are voting on. Mandy or Athena for clarification? Uh, Athena can go first if she would like. I, I have a feeling we're going to do the same thing. But GOL's review is clear, consistent, and actionable. So even if sponsors have opinions about the substantive issues, that's not a GOL. That's not what we're doing at GOL. So Mandy. what would happen if there's a substantive change made? 
that, that would go I, to the council. That, oh, okay. that, that's what I was going to address. Um, the sponsors in, in the past, when things like that has have happened, um, it's been it, GOL has either looked at whatever came from the committee um, without the substantive changes, but sometimes GOL looks at it with the substantive changes and at least recognizes that the substantive changes are done in response to legal. Um, and that those changes seem generally are noted, I think, when it makes it to the council of versus, you know, there's a difference between what the committee looked at and what the council has. And here are the reasons there's that difference and the legal opinions generally provided and all. So uh, uh, part of the reason why Pat and I need to really look at it is there are a few substantive things in there that may need additional talking to people because many of those substantive things were things provide were words provided by town staff, not us in general. So um, we we need to we need to figure out what's going on and and look at it closely. But I do want to say I remember very specifically with the uh, first time the children's mental health resolution uh, proclamation rather came up uh, that there was some struggle about around language. And I was able to, uh, I sat and I rewrote what the, I thought the sponsors were trying to say, and they were present. And, and I, they, oh, go sorry. Ahead. No, that's all right, go ahead. What I was gonna say is with bylaws, um, in the past, sometimes GOL has accepted some of those changes as for the purpose of making something actionable or making something right. consistent or clear. Um, as long as the sponsors agree to it. So it, it's kind of fluid, Jennifer. <laughs> I think in this scenario, Mandy and Pat, it sounds like you're planning on sending something to GOL with changes based on KP Law's recommendation for GOL to review with clarity, consistency, and actionability. Is that right? So I would say that it's probably not appropriate to do that during a GOL meeting exactly. because that's not part of your review. But if you have a new, um, if you have changes based on KP law, then you would forward those onto GOL. Right. And that's, that sound like, that sounds like what you're trying to do. Is that right. right? And that's why we're withdrawing it now. Yeah. Um, you're so withdrawing I'm, gonna... I'm sorry. I want to, I want to follow through with some questions as well, but Jennifer, go ahead. No, I just want to say, I appreciate that because I, I was very, I emailed Athena just a half hour before the meeting, because I was like, so yes, I appreciate that when it comes back, you will have, I guess we were going to have to veer into a discussion of substance, which didn't feel comfortable. So I think this, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we're, we won't be in that position today. Yeah. So Pat, mm -hmm. I want to clear up language because you've used the fact that it's not going to be on the agenda. And then you just used the words withdraw. And I think you mean postpone. Oh, postpone. Yes. Thank you for that correction. Anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, Go ahead. When will you be? When do you think you will be ready to come back? Uh, we will have to discuss that. Yeah, I I think the hope is that that it could still remain on the July the the August seventh. There's a GOL meeting on August second. August seventh. So, um, so it the need to Sorry. review KP law should not delay finalizing GOL review prior to August 7th. Okay, thank you. Okay, now the other thing that I would like to withdraw or uh, postpone, postpone, postpone please. thank you, thank you, um, is the bylaw review because we have not gotten word back yet from Carol Hepburn or the historic district. And so we can't, work on that and we have not gotten an update from Paul about the bylaws that have gone to the Human Rights Commission beyond the one we got earlier. Uh, and we need an update to know where people are. So we'll be bringing that back at, to our next meeting as well. So what we're gonna be looking at today are rules and procedure. And um, if Athena could pull them up, I'd like to start by going to, um, Rule six about, uh, I believe it's conduct. Mandy, is what you put in the packet um, the same as what we had? The it's, last the, 
I believe it is. It is the version I use to redraft rules five and six um, per GOL request. And so I don't think we've looked at that version since that redrafting. So I was hoping it's the right one, Athena. <laughs> And before we go on, I'm going to say that Councillor Miller has arrived. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask that you uh, let us know whether you can hear and be heard. Yes, thank you very much. Very well. Great. Thank you. And I add, Pat, you might, for uh, Michelle's uh, benefit, just repeat that we've postponed two items on the agenda. Yeah, we've postponed the zoning um, proposal review and we because of legal we want to really look at the legal thing and changes language changes substantive changes and we're um, not going we're postponing the bylaw review because we haven't gotten back information that we need to continue on that so those will both be postponed to the next meeting so we're going to look today at go back to rules of procedure and i would love it if we could go uh, i don't i didn't write the page down but a very, I'd like to go into rule six. So Pat, just yeah. for, as Athena pages through, I had yeah. rewritten rules five, well, revised oh. rules five and six based on the last GOL conversation regarding clarity on what's what in terms of where things should be. Okay, let's, okay, we can go back to five then. I'm sorry. Well, I don't know, I don't know why you wanted six, but some of what you're thinking about might be in five instead of six now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's totally possible. When I was reading it this morning, I didn't notice that, but let's go ahead. So Mandy, you want to pick up where we are here? Yeah, so our last conversation at GOL was really talking about the impacts of Southborough and right. what what is public comment rules versus what is rules of other conduct for the public at meetings who are in an audience versus speaking during the public comment period and not confusing them within the rules. Um, and then also talking about non-public comment periods, rules for comment for the rest of the meeting that is not a public comment period. And so yeah, and as I looked at the meeting gets difficult. So I was tasked with trying to clarify all of those different parts of the meetings and and rules within our structure now. And so I don't know what, I, I think blue might be the new changes. I um, believe that's true. That, that no one, that we haven't discussed, but it was attempting to uh, show and, and draft what we had discussed in GOL is what I would say. Um, so I reworded 5.1 into public comment period at meetings instead of, regular meetings to clarify what 5.1 is really discussing, which is public comment periods. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd like to, oh, I'm sorry, do this formally. Go ahead, Lynn, that's fine. I don't know if this is where it belongs, but I believe it does. Um, Andy Steinberg at our last council meeting, at the end of the meeting, uh, questioned whether or said he believes that one of the things we should discuss is the concept that someone might sign up for public comment and then yield their time to someone else and specifically someone else who has already spoken. Athena, do you have any information about that? Um, so some uh, Mandy has her hand up and she might say the same thing. Uh, some, some places allow that. I'm not sure if it's in their rules, but you hear that at some public meetings, folks yielding their time to the next person. I think that's probably a decision that the council can make about its own rules. Mandy? Uh, I was going to say the same thing. I'm, I'm trying to find it. I, I had thought we had, we had not said that yielding could not happen at, at least up until now in the public comment part of it, but I thought, and I was trying to find it, um, but oh. I might not have it. I thought we had said yielding would not be allowed for counselors and other speakers within the meeting, um, but I'm uh, browsing quickly is not always, well, yeah, the best. <laughs> but um, yeah, people, 
we could decide either way, right? But I think given that we have seen that happen recently, we should make a decision and make it clear within the rules. Because right now you read the rules and it says one person per comment period. That is unclear given what has been happening regarding yielding. Um, who is actually making the public comment if a time is yielded to someone else? Um, Athena, do you have any reference in Robert's rules? No, I, ha I haven't like looked at Robert's about this. I, I'm sorry, I what? I haven't looked at Robert's rules regarding this specific issue. Um, and open meeting law doesn't address public comment at all, so there's no guidance there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I would suggest on a D, number of public comments that we make a note at this point to come back to this with thoughts about yielding and clarification of one per person per comment. In other words, you're suggesting we don't discuss it now, Lynn. No, I, I, I'm perfectly fine, but I just want to make sure that we decide where we might speak to this or something. I mean, it, I definitely, I mean, I, I hope that we can start wrapping this up. So if we go ahead and have a discussion about it, that's fine. Well, it's interesting to me because the first one of the first times it happened. Oh, Jennifer, you go first. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Go ahead. No, no, that's great. I'm just, um, yeah. Well, it sounds. I, I mean, I am wondering if we look in Robert's rules, if you know, if there's sort of a default, you know, I because it's not something we see ha happen a lot. But I, I just assumed when it happened, it was just a basic part maybe of, of how me Robert's rules. That's what but I, I, this is, I'm not saying we want to do this, but, um, but we might, I mean, could you, could, could we, could it be whatever we wanted it to be? So could you say you can, um, you know, yield your time once, you know, or so, because it seemed, so it doesn't happen, you know, five or six times. That's my question to Athena, I guess. Athena? But answer if you can answer her question, but you had your hand up to make a uh, comment of your own. Whether or not Robert's rules addresses this issue, the council's rules supersede Robert's rules. Gotcha. Okay. So, so the council can make a decision about its own rules that would that would apply before we go to Robert's rules. And since the rules at this moment are silent on that issue, I'm which uh, I'm not sure that it's silent. Actually, I need to check the rule book, but um, the council can make a different decision about how to address that issue. Okay, thank we you. We can make any decision we want. <laughs> well, <laughs> as long as it's in compliance with the other uh, laws, which we have just recently learned in South Borough that there are other laws to take into consideration regarding public comment. So as long as you're not in violation of those laws, which yeah. supersede the council's rules, right. then you can make a different decision about how to take that up. Yeah. Mandy, and then I'll make a comment. So I would write into the rules that yielding of time is not allowed. Um, we already have in the rules that public comments are one per person per comment period. Um, yielding essentially allows a person, if they are organized, to make multiple comments during a public comment period or extend their comment time but be longer than three minutes. Um, and so I feel like it um, does not treat everyone identically um, in terms of the amount of time people get to speak at public comment periods. Um, so I am not in favor of allowing yielding. I would prohibit it I, I would just completely prohibit it. Yeah, there's another, um, this is not the comment I was planning to make, uh, but I also remember that there are times when people say, oh, I have, an, I, I have a different topic, so I'm gonna, I wanna be able to speak again, and that's been allowed. And so I think that's something that has to go into this mix as well. Athena, before I continue, go ahead. I think Andy brought this up too, but the issue of how to, how to deal with um, people going over their time 
and and how the council wants to address that. I think Andy brought that up as well, and that might be worth part of yeah. this discussion. Okay, so we'll we're going yes, thank you on that. And before Michelle, I'd like to to say uh, the very first time that in recent memory that there was time yielded, it seemed uh, reasonable. This last time. Uh, where the same person was yielded to uh, two or three times, and then they didn't really want to speak either of those times, and then somebody else, then the person yielded their time to somebody else. That feels like an imbalance, where the first one um, yielding it, giving additional time to somebody, felt kind of reasonable, but uh, on Monday, I did not find that reasonable. So I really want to look at that. Michelle? Thank you, Pat. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yeah, I guess another just point of view to think about is, to me, when I've seen it happen, both at the school committee meetings and in our meetings when it's happened, it feels like activism. It feels like a way to show solidarity. Um, it feels to me, uh, while I understand that if it got out of control, um, you know, that might posit a challenge for us. Um, but I personally just like culturally think I I'm on the opposite side of Mandy on this one. I feel I um, would absolutely uh, want to allow it um, and with some specific criteria in there um that would be clear about you know what it means so that's my thoughts right now on this thank you uh did i see in jennifer uh, athena go ahead i advise strongly against making this about what the issue uh, someone is talking about it should it, the rules ought to be applied equally regardless of the content of the public comments. The, I'm sorry, regardless of the content, did you content. say that? Right, so. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I think so we're not say, to get saying, that so, saying that someone has an important issue and so we're gonna allow them to speak more than everyone else, I think is, is a dangerous position to put the council in because Somebody else might say that what they're saying is also very important, and the council cutting them off is uh, not applying the rules equally. So yeah. I, adv I advise against making it about the content of the public comment. If you want to allow people to yield time, then everyone should be allowed to yield time regardless of what it's about. If you want to let people go over, then you need to let people go over regardless yeah. of what they're talking about. But this is this becomes problematic and and because there is there is a lack of consistency in out, in applying the rules that we have and that concerns me uh Jennifer and then I believe it's Michelle and then Lynn thank you Athena um Jennifer? yeah so I I would want to maybe explore this I I feel like this doesn't come up very often it's just like limiting you know public comment because we don't want it to go on for three hours when that's rarely rarely on that slippery slope or slope at all. Um, so if I would feel more comfortable saying like um, it could happen once or twice in a meeting that you could yield to someone that's already spoken that something between not at all and um, where it could, what is that called when they do it in Congress? Um, you know, when you just keep talking, I'm forgetting the word. Filibuster. Filibustering, right. <laughs> You know, something between not at all. I'm going to do that at the next great. council meeting so we get a good taste of it. Right. That, that was the word. Thank you. So that that's where I'm going with this. I'd like to find some happy medium. Michelle? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, uh, clarify my comment. I don't know if Athena was was responding to what I had said, but I, 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 I didn't mean to say that uh, it was, uh, you know, regarding the particular content, um, I just mean to say that I think that it brings something to the table that I value. I guess is what I'm saying. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't about your comment at all. Other, other oh, people okay. had said. Other people had said. You know, that someone had something important to say, or someone wanted to say something about two different issues, and so we're going to allow them to talk twice. So. Um, not, no, not specifically about yours. Okay, perfect. Okay. 
Thank you. Lynn? Um, I, I don't believe we should completely eliminate yielding, but I think we should, li li we should limit the number of times one individual can have, can be yielded to. That's, I don't, that's very awkward language, uh, but um, I'm, I'm kind of with Michelle on this one. I, I understand that it's, it could be cultural, it could be political, it could be advocacy, um, but I- It's a strategy, let's it's, get real. It's a strategy and, and some people have been using that strategy recently. Uh, and we leave it to the public to judge how effective that is. Uh, but let me just say, I would prefer that we just limit the number of times time can be yielded to an individual who's already spoken. Mandy? So I'm trying to go through some scenarios. You get someone that comes to a meeting or has three people in their household so they can raise their hand on Zoom three times because they have themselves, a spouse, and two kids. And someone who lives alone and can't attend a meeting who can only raise their hand once. The person that happens to have multiple people in their household once they learn this rule can get 12 minutes to speak. The person who doesn't gets three minutes to speak. What I'm hearing from Lynn and others is saying, well, you know, six minutes a person might not be that bad. Well, if six minutes is what we want, we should just make it six minutes per person, no yielding, and allow everyone an equal opportunity to have an equal amount of time to speak um, without preference to whether they can garner friends to come and either in person sign up and sit there until their time is called to say, I'm going to yield my time to someone else or to garner friends online to do the same thing. Um, I think we should treat people who know the system and don't know the system the exact same and yielding preferences those who can work the system. Um, so if we don't think three minutes is enough time for people to speak in public comment, then we should raise the minute level for everyone not allow some people to speak more than once because they have friends or know that they can work the system to get people to yield to them. Okay. Athena? Um, I had a, a different suggestion from Mandy's um, that might address the issue in a different way that's not yielding, that would maybe prevent that multiple people in a household from doing that over and over again. Right now we have number of public comments, one per person per comment period. You could clarify that one per person per comment period, if time allows, you, you allow another comment by the same person rather than yielding. You could say, if you want more than three minutes, then you get in line behind everyone else who hasn't spoken yet. Mm. So you could allow for two rounds for everyone. <clears throat> and prohibit yielding. And that might um, address some of the comments that Mandy made. I think that's an interesting idea. Uh, Jennifer, did you have your hand up and take it down? Uh, yeah, I did. I wanted okay. to. Michelle? I didn't actually mean to raise my hand, but since it raised on, <laughs> the raised. Um, I, I like Athena's um, like, thought process on that. Um, if we are, I don't know where we're at with the 120 minutes. Um, if you maybe have already approved that previously when I wasn't at a meeting, but um, I think the idea of allowing for a second round, if we're still within that uh, public comment period could be um, a good way to, to reach the same goal. It, it's still, there's still something nagging at me about like the act, the advocacy piece um, that I value, but um, you know, I think that if it reaches the same goal, um, I would I would be supportive of that. Yeah, and I feel like I could deal with Athena's version if it, if we were very clear 
about how it worked. Um, but it does, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's all right. I don't, go But ahead. it does seem to me that if we do that, and it's an interesting idea, okay? I, I'm, we then need to also be very clear that yielding your, one's time is not allowed. Right. So it's it's a combination of the two and that it still is maxed at two public comments. Because otherwise I can be at the end of the line and then I can be at the end of the line and then I can be at the end of the line and mm -hmm. I might be the end of the line. And so I have unlimited three minute periods. <laughs> Right, that was my suggestion to to do um, yes. a sec a second round rather than yielding, so that people wanting to speak twice aren't oh. um, speaking again before other folks have a chance to speak. And it would be up to up to you and the council if you want to do two rounds or more than two. That's interesting because I didn't catch that uh, that somehow in my little note that I'm writing here as you spoke. So everybody, anyone who spoke, would have a chance to speak again either on the same issue or another issue, but there would be no yielding of time. Right. I can, yeah, I could go with that. I Because in a certain sense, it opens up, it, it's more equitable to everyone. Um, and, you know, it's, as I said, it, it was very interesting last, on Monday, the differences in the two Mondays, one where it was quite effective, which the person spoke one more time, and the other night where it started to just kind of be um, conf less productive. Uh, Lynn and then Mandy Joe, or Lynn, did you have your hand? I do. Um, I, I just want us to think about this, okay? And I'm not saying I'm against it. I want to think about it. It now means that person A who spoke gets to the end of the line and spends their time rebuttaling and criticizing person D who spoke. And then person D says, I want a second time, even though I didn't sign up. And it, it changes the a little bit. I mean, we already get you know, I don't agree, I do agree, that kind of thing. And that's, you know, that is public debate and that is something the council should listen to. So I'm not saying I, we shouldn't do this or that we don't want public debate at council meetings. I'm just saying, I want us to think about what this could look like. Mandy? I was just gonna say, if we go with Athena's idea, item B, the length of individual public comment is where I would suggest at the end of that we put yielding of your time shall not be allowed. Um, and item D is where we would put one per person per comment period and then there'd be a sentence that says something like if there remains time in the public comment period under section C above, um, any person who has previously commented may speak, may make one more public comment. I don't know what the language would be, but that's yeah. where I would put it in section D that clarifies that it's within the time listed in C, then we'd have to come up with wording, but that's what I would do. But I would put the yielding, the inability to yield under item B. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jennifer. Okay, so this uh, Athena, did you get that all before? Sorry, Jennifer. It's okay. No problem. Yeah, I'm making notes now. Yeah. You need you need some yeah more time. I think Mandy Joseph oh in section C. Yeah. No, I thought it was B. Uh -huh. And then, yes, I, I I misheard. Sorry, that's all right. And I don't think that the uh, committee has recommended 120 minutes yet. 
So it, it sounds like that would go hand in hand if if this comes, those changes would come together. Hmm. Jennifer? Uh, my printer just went on. So go to Lynn, if you could go to Lynn and come back because it's noisy. Okay. Lynn? Yes. Uh, I'm wondering if on a second round, we do go to a two minute limit. That feels reasonable to me. And I don't know. I, I'm even wondering whether uh, having a two hour public comment period is, I mean, we, I, I, I think we've hit that, <laughs> but I don't know. Anyway, no. Jennifer. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, I don't, know that I'm comfortable saying it has to be within the, what is it, hour and 20 minutes. Um, I feel more comfortable with what you just suggested, Pat, that everyone has a chance to speak again, but maybe the second time it's two minutes. So then everyone, I don't think it's going to come up very often, but everyone would have a chance to make a second comment. But I think if that second comment and then do we have to specify, I guess, whether it's on the same topic or another. So I, I think that's an, um, no. an, an interesting and um, suggestion, Pat, and worth discussing. That seems to me, I feel more comfortable with that than saying there can only be a second comment if it's within the time allotted in B. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Mandy, I think you're next. Thanks. Um, section E3 has a draft that non-residents um, or no, anyone wait. who's not on a register don't get to speak if we've already exceeded 30 minutes. So, so C and E3, I think the last time we talked, um, we're sort of a working together. If it's a really big issue, um, that attracts a lot of residents will go about two hours before we stop, but um, we need to preference residents first and we need to, for Lynn to be able to decide two versus three minutes, she needs, the presiding officer needs to know who all, how many people are seeking to speak. Um, and so E was to say, you know, we're going to preference residents first. Um, and so only, uh, and, and I think the people not on the register or having raised their hand, that was to address the concern Lynn just talked about with um, a second public comment period of people who didn't originally intend to make a comment, they hear stuff and they want to rebut that and it just goes on and on. And then Lynn based the three minutes on five people had raised their hand and suddenly 30 people raised their hand because they want to rebut and have that public debate within public comment. Um, and so I, I don't know with, with what we're talking about or deciding and discussing regarding a second sort of comment period for any one individual, um, how item E3 works into that, um, number one. Number two, I again go back to if we want to say, well, everyone can speak twice. What's the purpose of the second speaking? I guess that that's what I'm struggling with. What is the need for the second comment period? Is it to allow someone longer time to express their views? If so, we should just increase the amount of time of the public comment period from three minutes to something else. If we're feeling three minutes is not enough. Um, if the second public comment period is to allow someone to expand on their comments and make more lengthy comments, just let them do that in the first place. If it's to allow for the rebuttal and all that Lynn said, well, that's a different, that's a different concept, I would argue, of public comment. That almost becomes more like a public dialogue within a public comment period. And I think we should discuss that, what our goal of 
public comment periods or what the purpose of a public comment period is. Is it really for public dialogue or is it for public comment to the council? I, I want to add something to that that you triggered in, in me uh, uh, thinking about, and I know I'm jumping the line, but I'm going to take that. And thanks, Michelle and Jen. Um, we are not allowed as counselors to debate what is said or comment on what's said in public comment periods. Um, and certainly that mistake has been made. I've made it at least once, but once I think. But so it is not a public debate. Public comment is not a debate period. It's not a dialogue period between residents. It is a period of time for the council to receive the concerns and opinions and desires of residents to listen carefully and to allow hopefully those things to affect decision making um, where appropriate. Um, so I, I'm really, I think that we're accidentally creating and the more that we talk about public debate, the more we're walking away from what public comment, a com public comment period is about. So I'm kind of moving to a different place. Michelle and then Jennifer. Yeah, I appreciate that, Pat. And I, I was thinking about, you know, there are times I think maybe where a person gets up to give public comment and they've forgotten something they wanted to say or something comes to them as they're listening. Um, it may not necessarily be to rebut what somebody said, but it just like Pat said, what you said just triggered something in me. And then she went on to say, you know, I think that can happen. Um, but I, I actually, I wanted to clarify, Jennifer, were you saying that if we allowed two periods for everyone that you would want that to be able to expand beyond 120 minutes if it happened to? Well, I think what we're, if we say public comment can exceed 120 minutes, then if we get to 120 minutes and everybody's spoken once, then no one has a chance to speak again. Mm -hmm. Or if five people had a chance to speak a second time and there's still 10 exactly. people waiting to speak a second time. Right. Okay, I can see where they're, yeah, I think we have to kind of th choose how, how, yeah, how to approach that. Okay, Jennifer, so if you have. Well, I just feel like as we talk that maybe the simplest, fairest, I don't know way to do it is what we started with of everyone, people would, be permitted to yield one time to someone who's already spoken. And again, I don't think this comes up very often, but. No, it will. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so what if, uh, you know, that's, I think that's where we started. Maybe that I'm beginning to go back. Yeah, I'm beginning. It, it's interesting because I'm moving to not allowing the yield. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, but the other thing is the public doesn't know that we have a 120 minute rule. So it seems to me that if we're gonna say that we have 120 minutes and they're in our rules of procedure, somehow or other that's gotta be added to the statement about public comment, which actually scares the bahookies out of me because I feel like, whoa, who, what if people decide, oh, I, 20, 120 minutes, let's stack it. Uh, so I'm wondering if that time period thing isn't a little, um, dangerous is the wrong word, because, you know, but the business of the council is to do its work. Part of its work is listening, but it is not the uh, only component in a council meeting. And there, you know, there are other issues that we need to think about. Um, Michelle. Oh, just real quick, Pat. We don't oh. have a we don't have a hundred twenty minute limit yet. The council hasn't voted on that. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, we have. Uh, right, but that it would have. Yes, thank you. We, but it would have to be announced. It would have to be. Um, all these rules somehow or other have to get out to the public, and I think that's a positive thing. Michelle. Yeah, just building on that a little bit, Pat, and also thinking about Andy's second comment at the end of our um, meeting on Monday. 
I do think it would be really helpful for the presiding officer um, before public comment begins to be clear, just take two minutes to say very clearly what the rules are and to also say, everybody is gonna be treated equally here. Don't take it personally. And if you get beyond your time, Dean is gonna move you back into the audience or whatever, however, you know, just so that it's like clear so that Lynn or whoever the presiding officer is, is not in a position where they're feeling it becomes personal, like to them, you know, depending on who's speaking. I think just saying right up front, um, you have three minutes to speak. Everybody will be, you know, cut off no matter who you are. You're my best friend or you're my worst enemy. You're gone after three minutes. Um, I think that would help because um, it would sort of set the stage in a way. I think, I don't know, Lynn, if, if we've just gotten used to maybe not uh, just th f thinking that maybe folks already know what the rules are before public comment, but a little statement might go a long way. Lynn? Um, I, I'm, I like that suggestion. Uh, it still doesn't resolve some of the right. dilemma because of uh, issues, frankly, that have come up when it is a person with a disability or a person who's BIPOC or something like that, and maybe they needed a little more time or, you know, somebody who's never spoken before. We've seen this. They're obviously nervous. They take a little more time. Um, that's one issue. Another issue came up on Monday night that I found extremely uncomfortable, and and I just have to be honest, and that is Mindy Dom, who said she was going to try to be there in person, had contacted me. She ended up being delayed getting out of the State House in Boston, so she called from her car to make public comment. In some arenas, for example, when you do a hearing at the State House, even if you're on Zoom, all legislators speak first, and then the general public speaks. So now Mindy is not, quote, a counselor, but she is, as is Joe, as frankly are our congressmen and our senators. Um, you know, they are people who are directly, uh, you know, in, in, in serious ways able to carry messages for us to the state house and in return carry back so i i felt even though i i don't think mindy could see the clock i have no idea if she could or not she i don't i think she may have been on i didn't reinforce the three minutes as strongly as i should have that last night on monday night but I just felt com uncomfortable. I mean, if that had been any of the other people I just mentioned, I would be just as uncomfortable cutting them off. But here's the problem, Lynn, when a representative is presenting, they don't have a time limit. She came in to public comment, and if we treat her differently, then we're open to attack for, for other, by other people. The, and this is what also came out of Southboro. The more consistent we can be, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us, the better for the progress of the meeting and better for the for residents who go, oh, wow, this really is you know, pretty important. Right now, if we cut off a person of color, we get one reaction. Mm -hmm. And and. Although I feel like that's changed in the sense that uh, what I've seen is that people are going, okay, it's three minutes, and then boom, it's not three minutes. If she had come in to present, even if we had interrupted public comment to have her present, that's and and return to it. But we cannot make those kinds of exceptions during public comment. And I feel you can tell I feel strongly about it, and not, you know it's 
And I, but I understand. I understand the discomfort. I can see it on your face. I can see it on the face of other counselors. So I, you know, I appreciate that, and, and it's hard. Yeah, and I again, we're not just making these rules for me. We're making them for the for entire every, any, yes, yeah. for anybody who is presiding, right? Uh, and so I, I just want to raise that issue. And and in this particular instance, I feel that if I had put on the agenda, if I had known forty eight hours in advance that Min, that that's what Mindy wanted to do, if I had put that on as a special comment from Mindy Dom, and it was completely about the ARPA money then why am I not, I'm at that point, I am totally advantaging her and disadvantaging all the others who, who are speaking about the ARPA money. So- But the thing is, she didn't ask to have a presentation. No, she no, asked she for public comment and she needs to be treated like any other Amherst resident, which is what she is. And, and if she ha was going to ask, my this is my point though, if she was going to ask, to have a special period of comment. And I said to her, well, what will it be focused on? And she says, ARPA, then have I advantaged her to speak about ARPA in a way I'm not advantaging other residents? Yeah, no, I hear that. And that's why, you know, and that I stand corrected there, but she asked to be part of public comment. That's, that's what- I agree. About I agree. ARPA I agree. funds. I, I'm just, so, I have shared how I personally felt as the presiding officer that night cutting off our state representative. That's, well, I've shared it. I'd, I'd like to hear other comments. Okay, Mandy, and then Michelle, and then Jennifer. I appreciate the difficulty as a presiding officer in cutting off anyone, particularly someone who has an elected office higher than us, or a staff member, not during public comment, right? We have similar rules about three minutes for our own counselors and staff members in responding to stuff and all. Um, but to go back to Lynn's example of the state house hearings, yes, they may take other representatives and senators first at the hearings, but they those representatives and senators still have to abide by the three minute limit that everyone else has to. And they 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 can do it and they do do it because that's the expectation that has been, um, that's the rules and the rules are enforced. Part of our issue here is that we have rules that are not enforced consistently and therefore are always up for argument that so-and-so or such and such community is being privileged or some voice is being privileged because we as presiding officers, not just you Lynn at council meetings, but we as presiding officers in public comment periods at committees and all are not fully consistent. And that's part of the problem. I'm not going to get into where Mindy should have potentially done her comments or what could have happened, but she was making a comment during public comment period, and everyone must follow those rules, no matter their status of employee, non-employee, elected official, non-elected official, elected official from another town or not, we have rules. I feel like we need to enforce them. And if a presiding officer is not comfortable enforcing them, they need to find another way to consistently enforce them because it's their job as a presiding officer to enforce them, be it themselves or find some other mechanism that is enforceable. Michelle? Um, Lynn, to your point about had Mindy contacted you, um, I I couldn't really hear what Mindy was saying, but um, I think there's a difference between coming and expressing an opinion, you know, in public comment 
even if it's on ARPA, right? So a, a difference between expressing an opinion or bringing, um, you know, the opinions of constituents forward and providing the council with valuable information in how they might uh, approach the ARPA funds. So had she come to you, Lynn, and said, you know, I have this valuable information that I think would help um, that's trickling down from the state or elsewhere um, in, in terms of approaching the distribution of funds. I think that would have been perfectly reasonable to have her on the agenda to speak to that. But it sounded like if I could hear her right that she was expressing an opinion about how ARPA funds should be distributed. And then in that case, um, coming in through public comment is appropriate. And then, of course, um, keeping her to the same rules of everyone else is, is most appropriate too. Okay. Uh, thank you for that insight from all of you. So I want to now move to, I'm not moving away, I'm moving into this issue more. Okay. Mechanisms for limiting and whether or not perhaps there is another person who is designated on the counselor, council to try to keep time versus the person who's also presiding. And then, and what do we do? Do we literally throw somebody off and put them in the audience? Do we mute them? What are we planning to do that basically says you're done? You've had your three minutes. And I, I use those terms because it really feels rough. Mm -hmm. It feels really rough. Thank you. And just a quick point. You can't mute people in person. <laughs> no. Pat. Jennifer, go ahead. I thought you know, I said. Do, yeah. I mean, could Athena, I mean, do any um, councils have like a, a literally a buzzer that goes off or something that the clerk of the council, you know, like literally, it's, I think sometimes because we don't hear anything, people may not be watching the clock. Um, I mean, if you heard like a bing, then, you know, okay, your time is off. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like um, I've watched people change they, once they learn to use the clock in, as, a, as a speaker. They pay attention to it, and people were paying attention to it uh, on uh, Monday. Yeah, yeah, and I think Mindy couldn't see the clock if she was in her car. Yeah, I mean, I, no, she probably couldn't. But that's I know that's another that's beside the point. But yeah, well, it's not beside the point, right. but that it speaks to the fact that the preside the presiding officer or the de designated person needed to interrupt. Um, the other thing, and I'm just going to throw this in as a, as an aside. We don't follow our own rules. We have rules about liaisons that have been in place since the beginning of the council. And there are counselors who refuse to follow those rules. And does that mean we change the rule to fit because they're not following it or do we keep it in place? I'm gonna to go to Athena and then Mandy and Michelle. You're right, lots of rules get broken. Um, I can... Um... I could play a sound. I do have the the timer um, change colors when it, you're getting right. close to the end of your time. But Lynn, I might suggest because you often say, "Please wrap up." You know, when the timer turns yellow or red, you have, you know, saying you have 15 seconds left or whatever. And then when the timer gets to zero, your time is up, and that's it. Your time is up. Yeah, Rather than please wrap up, please wrap up, please wrap up. That's my suggestion. Yeah, and it doesn't mean somebody's not going to go on forever, but I think again, it's a quality of consistency. I think it's Mandy Michelle. Oh, sorry, one one more quick thing. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you, talking about how to deal with breaking rules, uh, and Pat, your comment was that other counselors <laughs> break rules, <laughs> and I just wanted to point out. Everybody breaks rules, yeah. including you. <laughs> oh, I know I do. I, 
but I go home and beat myself up about it afterwards. Anyway, but but also, I mean, committee reports are are they're supposed to include motions. Those that, that doesn't always happen. The committee reports are due at a certain time. That doesn't always happen. We're supposed to get materials out a certain number of days in, in advance, and we know that doesn't happen. I'm sending stuff out over the weekend. So I think what you're talking about is, is specific to during council meetings. But there are lots of other rules that don't apply during council meetings that get broken too and um to, uh, not not to say that you have to talk about those today but yeah it no might, we it might be talk worth about talking before we're about. done that's for yeah. sure okay but you know i did not know because i didn't pay i didn't look at the rules uh that motions and needed to be included in the so well then i'm wagging my finger at you <laughs> for not it's reading the rules it's, it's everyone's responsibility was... to know the it's counselor's <laughs> responsibility to know the rules and then, right. and then how to how that's to enforce right. the rules yeah that's right and and so i have no excuse except that you guys were silly enough to pick me um mandy and then michelle and then lynn is your hand up to speak yes okay so i was going to suggest some of the things athena did which is at least at council meetings, a clock is run on the screen. And that clock at 30 seconds left turns yellow and at 15 seconds left turns red and at zero, it starts blinking red. Um, at zero is too late to say time to wrap up. At 30 or 15 seconds left, someone, and I believe it's the role of the presiding officer is the one that needs to say, you need to wrap up, you have 15 seconds left. Um, at zero, you need to say your time is up. And every five seconds after zero, you need to continue to say your time is up or every 10 seconds, some sort of consistent one to get the point across. Um, as a presiding officer in committee meetings that do interviews where there are time limits, it is very un uncomfortable to interrupt someone when you know they haven't finished what they wanted to say. But if you're going to take on the role of presiding officer, I personally believe this is one of the roles you take on, enforcement of the rules, no matter how uncomfortable enforcement of the rules becomes. Um, I think a buzzer would help, a little ding at 30 seconds, another ding at 15, and then something in. Um, rock climbing that I now do where they have time limits and you are off the wall at the end of your time limits and nothing counts at the end of the time limits, the last five seconds each get a ding. Beep, 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 beep. And you know your time's up. So I think there's ways to audibly indicate to everyone and then with a with a timer, a neutral timer that is not a voice, but the voice is extremely important. Um, and that I think should come from the presiding officer. It's easy to say mute someone on Zoom because we have the ability to do that. Um, but then you're treating the Zoom participants differently than those in person. Right. Right. Because you can't, unless unless the presiding officer or someone near the mic is literally going to walk up to that desk and hit the mic button. <laughs> um, and that still doesn't necessarily stop them from talking, but at least it stops them from being broadcast. Um, you can't treat the Zoom people the same as the in-person people if you're cutting mics, unless a presiding officer or someone has control of the mic at that chair and could remotely turn it off like you can on Zoom. And maybe that's possible. I don't know. Um, that means they're still sitting there and you have to move on might be while they're sitting there and you move on to a Zoom person, but um, it can be done. It's uncomfortable. Um, you know, it, it is uncomfortable. I, I hate doing it myself. I really do. Um, but to treat everyone the same and in interviews, it becomes really important to treat everyone the same. You can't give someone five minutes and another person three minutes um, because they're interviewing. I, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think you've made your point. Um, so I'm cutting you off because uh, I break the rules. Um, Michelle, and I'm also, I'm, I'm quickly wondering what were the town meeting rules that the community three minutes accepted? Yeah. And Michelle? 
Yeah, I want to support the audible buzzer. I've seen that they use it in Northampton. Um, it works really well. Um, and it, it sort of takes the personal piece out of it for the presiding officer. Um, it's, I think probably, I don't, I don't know, but I would imagine it's a little more, I mean, Athena is the one that has to really deal with the clock and resetting it, but that's, you know, I, I do support the audible buzzer. The other thing I think is, imp it's important to remember, I don't know how, how many of you um, set your timer when you're reading written public comment. I, I don't. Um, so people can go on for 20 minutes in their written public comment, and we're going to read it because that's our responsibility. So I think encouraging people or like differentiating to people that one, if you haven't gotten anything, everything out in your three minutes, please write to us. Um, and you can take all the time in the world and we're going to read it. And number two, you know, there is sort of a potentially just a distinction between what you might be able to get across in your written public comment, like even in Mindy's case, which was she had a lot to say, you know, and many people do, um, from what point you might be making in your public comment at a meeting. And so just like reminding people that you you write to us and you've got all the time in the world. And just I think that that's a good encouragement, um, you know, that we can make. Okay, Jennifer, and then yeah, just wanted to say, like as Michelle said, um, I think the the audible um, buzzer could be very helpful, and it does. I, I think it's just too easy to ignore even the presiding officer saying you have thirty more seconds. You hear the buzzer, and it kind of tells everyone that your time is up. So I would support that. Then um, this has been very helpful. I uh, want to ask that in the interest of respecting those people who are blind and colorblind, that we do have a buzzer, uh, that uh, it goes off at 30 seconds before the end, that as presiding officer or that the presiding offer, officer uh, say something at 15 seconds and then, and it, it's a red light, and then it's, you know, and then red lights and red blinking lights and then end. And that we, I'll obviously be working on my script for the seventh where I lay this out. Um, and because none of this has to be in the rules, by the way. Um, it, I think it needs to be though. It, I, as much as we can needs to be in the rules, but we don't have to pass these rules to do another trial at town at town council meeting we can try this at the coming meeting yes, yes. Can, you know reinforce the many ways in which you can get our attention through public comment written and or otherwise and so let me work with athena i also just need to ask athena when you are in a council meeting if you don't have an assistant does one of the assistants job is that they can relieve you in setting resetting the clock or do they reset the clock or how do you do that? Because I know sometimes you can't get to resetting the clock because you're doing something else. Um, no, when I have a minute taker, they just take minutes. Um, it's easier to, to do multiple things when I have um, someone doing minutes for me, but um, hopefully I'll have a, a replacement for Kelly sooner than later. Um, and I'll have to figure out how to do so right now the way the timer works is that it's um, a virtual camera so it's replacing the the front facing camera that I have on my computer so I'll have to figure out a different way because I can't do um, an audible buzzer so I'll have to do something different and it might, it might end up being a share screen of a timer instead so that I can enable the sound um, so uh, that might be something that we need to try, not on the seventh, but the meeting following, because I won't be at the seventh. Um, Thank you. So, so we can try that and see how that goes. Um, Thank you. But I, I, I think not having a minute taker at the same time is, you know, maybe shouldn't be part of the consideration because it's just right. something we have to work out. I want to say something directly to you, Lynn. Thank you for the work you do as the presiding officer. It is difficult. It's difficult as a human being to sit there. It's difficult to receive criticism 
from people publicly. It's difficult to have residents be angry at you because you're asking them to stop uh, at a proposed timeline or something. So I don't want us to lose track of what it feels like uh, to do the work that you're doing. So. Oh, and, and the chairs of committees have the yes. same. Also, yes, yes. Uh, are we going to try to finish this section? And what are we finishing? And we've had to, you know, we've kind of wandered a little bit through various topics. I want to suggest we go back and see what we can do to finish this section. Uh, that's a good idea. Uh, what I got, what I have um, is that there seems to be a consensus about an audible buzzer as being valuable and important. Um, uh, that uh, the buzzer goes off 30 seconds before the end of the person's time, a lot of time. At the end of uh, when their time is uh, down to 15 seconds, the presiding officer says, and then we have the red blinking lights. Mm -hmm. Does that feel? At 15 seconds, the presiding officer says, you have 15 seconds to wrap up. Yeah. At, at the time the blinking light goes off, the presiding officer says, your time is up. And the second, and they keep saying that whether it's every five seconds or whatever. Yeah, or just stops, who knows? Um, well, but we, that, yeah. we have to make sure we don't treat people on Zoom different. Differently, than yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, are people comfortable with what just got laid out in terms of the buzzer, the time, notifying a speaker that, um, about the time frame, uh, warning them as they go through. Is there any disagreement about that? Do we need to make this as a motion or how does this sound? Or I, do I, I would suggest that you include it in your GOL report for the next meeting and then, then you know, before public comment begins, um, mm -hmm. we could even put a little GOL update Mm -hmm. before public comment, just to make that announcement so that it's clear before it happens next time. But um, also, like I mentioned, I won't be able to do the buzzer and so forth at the August 7th meeting. So if GOL has um, recommendations for rule changes, um, maybe that should start the second meeting of August. I'm not sure if that's up to you. Athena, um, is Kelly going to fill in on the 7th? No. So that means Paul or I have to work the buzzer. Well, I, my suggestion is not to implement that on the seventh because well, but we have to work the that. clock. Neither of you are set up to do the clock the way I have it set up. So we can talk about that during agenda setting for the seventh, but it's going to. Thank you. I'm not sure how much you want to manage during that meeting. You've, you've, Thank you. you've said that you don't want staff. You, you don't want to ask people to come and attend. So, I mean, do you and Paul want to learn how to do everything that I do before the August 7th meeting? That's a question for you and Paul. Yeah, um, figure it out. So, and then if, and then if, this, if, blah, if this body wants to make recommendations for the 7th, I'm just letting you know that might be difficult to implement on the 7th. Um, and if you're going to have actual recommendations for rule changes, uh, that maybe that come up on the, at the next meeting. Right. Thank you. Hey, Mandy. So I'm confused. Are we trying to write these potential, how you manage the three minutes as a presiding officer into the rules? That's what, that is what Athena was suggesting. I no, was I, I wasn't suggesting the buzzer oh. and everything in the rules. I was saying that if you have, um, uh, um, if you want to implement the audible buzzer and so forth, that I won't be able to do that at the seventh, and I'm not sure that Paul or Lynn can juggle that at the seventh. Um, so we could we could try that out at the second meeting in August. But then, if you had recommendations for rule changes that you want to bring to the seventh, um, 
I mean, you can either bring those to the seventh or the next meeting. But so you I can bring the suggestions without actually trying it out at the seventh. Right, that could be, that could be part of the GOL report. Okay. And there's That's part of this that, you know, I, before we had the clock um, and we were during COVID, so we were virtual, I would use my own, you know. Yeah, oh, but yeah. there was a time, I think you asked Andy, you asked me once, I right. think that you're looking at your clock while you're trying to preside, it doesn't work. Um, no, Mandy, we're not trying to write it in the rules. You're, yeah, but I do want to get back to the things that we may want to write into the rules, which is uh, the idea of yielding or not having yielding number of times any person can speak, et cetera. Do you have anything that you wanted to add, Mandy? I don't believe I've changed my position on that part. <laughs> okay. So, um, so where are we about allowing yielding? Maybe that's what we need to come to some kind of resolution about right now. Jennifer? So I thought maybe where we got to was not allowing it at all, allowing yielding once to someone who's already spoken, or allowing everyone to have a second time to speak. I thought we were down right. to those three options. And I personally am um, open to the second, the last two, either allowing one time to yield to someone who's already spoken or giving everyone a chance to speak a second time. And maybe that second time is only two minutes. I am not allowed, uh, I am not in support of having everyone have an opportunity to speak twice. Um, I think I can deal with one yield. Pat, you might, you might include this in a GOL, GOL report and ask for council feedback. Because it sounds like there's, there's okay. not, not consensus. Um, you don't have well, to make a decision good. today if you want. Just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, what else do we need to look at around this issue right now or make or try to come to a decision about? Michelle had her hand up. I don't know whether she wanted to speak about this. Oh, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. No worries. I put it down, Pat. I was I was just going to support the one yield um, as a compromise to this as well, but I think uh, Athena made a good suggestion to get more feedback as well. Yeah. All right. Uh, where are we then? Are we moving on or? Mandy, do you still have sections of this that you? Well, oh, there are. If if Athena pages down, I, I think it's. Yeah. I don't know what the blue, if she finds the next blue, I think. I'm blue in her document. So there was one she just, I, I clarified that the general public comment period here, um, there could be other public comment periods on specific agenda right. items just to clarify that. Um, that's a simple change. Um, further, I think the next set of changes is really rule six for for what I, I did in response to GOL's discussions. There are other changes here. I don't know whether we've talked right. about. And yeah, there is really quick. So we're going to six, or is that that's what you're... where I wrote that? That's where most of the changes. Yes. Based on yeah. I want to go very quickly to uh, I believe it's six point four. Um, very quickly, because there's we have civility in there, and we do need to take that out. Um, but we can start up at the top. I just don't want to lose track of that. So Mandy, do you want to speak to the changes in blue? Um, sure. So um, this one was slightly harder, right? Because um, we had mixed a whole lot of different types of conduct throughout the different roles. <laughs> um, um, and, and it was trying to find a way to, to address all of them. So I think I caught 
you know, um, I captured, I think I captured most of the discussion. 6.1 is now related to essentially meeting participants that are participating in the meeting outside of general public comment. So that would be counselors, that would be staff that are invited, that would be any presenters, that would be any um, other members of committees that might be holding a joint meeting with us. Um, that That's what 6.1 is intended to capture, conduct of those individuals. Um, 6.2, I re renamed, or I guess Athena renamed it, um, 6.2 is meant for people in the audience. How are they supposed to, you know, what, what is their conduct? So outside of the public comment period, sitting in the audience. Um, and then 6.3 is also additional rules for counselor conduct outside of 6.1. Well, actually 6.1 is non-counselor invited speakers 6.3 is counselor again it gets right. kind of iffy right <laughs> but that's sort of what we were talking about so a lot of things are repeated within the within each section i believe um as we had talked about but that's that's sort of the order yeah I, and i want to say about the order um we had a resident who came forward and talked about the order in a in terms of the First people who need to behave themselves appropriately are counselors. And then, so that she feels like 6.3 should be 6.1 and then move to presenters and audience. And that seems like a minor thing, but I think that she's right. Um, so I'd like to see that change happen as well. I would agree, but I didn't think that was within my purview of what I was assigned to do, but I did think it weird that we had counselors last <laughs> and I thought it should be first too. So I would agree that. And in turn, yeah, and not because we're privileged, but because we're the ones who really need to learn how to behave. Um, so 6.1 would become 6.2 and 6.2 would be 6.3. I'm sorry, Lynn, I can't, I did, could, Lynn, were you speaking? No, okay. No, there's some background. Okay. Oh, sorry, that might be me. I, I forgot to mute. My, my mouse is being weird, so I, I can't make, it's difficult to make that change right now, but I'll, I made it. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I should have made it later. Um, uh, is there anything else in 6.3 that we... Counselor conduct? Yeah, here we go, yeah. On F. So I think F just combines G into F. Yeah. And and H or the old I, some of that. Um, we we had identified that some things were sort yeah. of repeated three times. Yeah. Okay. Anybody have any issue with the, any of these? Um, did did we talk about something um, uh, engage in personalities or something like that? Other body was that in here, Mandy? H talks about ad hominem comments for counselors. Can we use <laughs> um, English and not Latin? <laughs> Sure. It means mean <laughs> comments. It means attacking. Even even engage in personalities is a little hard to or understand. Personal attacks could also. Um, I don't know. Uh, how, however, you I mean, yeah, up to you if you want to use ad hominem or not. But I like it. <laughs> I like it. I studied Latin and Greek. La di da. Yeah. <laughs> Back in high school, Miss Ludwig. Um, so I, do people want to keep that or do you want to add um, to ch change it to disparaging language or whatever? Okay, let's leave it because I like it. Can we, can we keep scrolling? I'd like to go to 6.4. Oh, wait, we have to talk about one and two. Pat, oh, sorry. There were a number of changes there. Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so you're. 
so sorry, my scrolling is weird. I'm sorry about yeah, that. Yeah. No, so the goal of six point, uh, are we starting at 6.1? Okay. Yeah. Um, this was the invited speaker. So you'll see some of the same sort of, um, some same language, especially in item D mirrors the language in item H for counselors, um, the ad hominem comments and insulting, threatening or abusive language. So we should make sure those two lines agree, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. As I said, you'll see, um, so E is a repeat of something I added up in the initial rules, the cell phones, that is also up um, in the general, right under rule six before you get to 6.1. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I didn't know whether people wanted it to apply to everyone um, where it would be listed in six, Write a one more line up, Athena, if you can, um, right there. Oh, yes. Where it says cell phones. That's the exact same thing as listed in 6.1e. I don't think we need to list it twice. Um, it's just who do you want the cell phone silencing to apply to? Everyone or just certain people? I think it should apply to everyone. Um, you know, if you have, yeah, Michelle. Okay. Um, so the ruling that we have been talking about in relation to public comment, um, is that just like, did that ruling come out just with respect to a public comment period or because an invited speaker or presenter could be a member of the public? Mm -hmm. So if a member of the public is coming and then we're saying you have to follow these rules, you know, that it sounds to me like the ruling that we were talking about uh, is in opposition to that. So does anyone know if the ruling was um, limited to public comment period or or was it expanded to just include public at a meeting? I thought it was only public comment periods, but perhaps we should look, go back and look. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't read it. No, no, that's fine. that's fine. So I just, I wanna, cause I think we could step into something here if, you know, you know, depending on uh, who the invited speaker or presenter or panelist is, if they're a member of the public yeah. and if they go off on something and then we, ask them to follow the rules, have we violated that ruling? An so, invited speaker is very, go ahead, Lynn and then Mandy, whichever yeah, one. I, I'm, glad, I'm glad the invited speaker issues come up because I'd like to um, suggest two additions here. One is that the presiding officer be informed that there will be an invited speaker and there's an agreed upon uh, way in which that, I, I, let me just, ramble a moment okay and then figure out how we want to do it but the the presiding officer should be informed shall be informed that there is going to be an invited speaker and with the presenting counselor agree upon what role that person is going to play and how much time they will have for it and uh, you know i'm not being critical here but maybe i missed an email but you know, all of a sudden on the recent stretch code discussion, I find out there was an invited speaker and I was ready to move the thing to another night and the invited speaker, unknown to mm -hmm. me, was sitting in the back of the room. So I, I just felt a little un, you know, it, it led to just some confusion. That's all. So I, I would like to also agree in cases of invited speakers, does this include staff? And are there, see, I, what I've tried to do when I know in advance that something's going to happen is I sometimes even have a meeting with the group. I often send an email that says and make sure that, you know, you know all handouts or screen or um, slide presentations are sent to myself and Athena by Wednesday of the week before of the week before the meeting. You know, so I go through a whole process and I want to make sure that who do we agree as invited speakers? Are they also staff? 
And where does the issue of time limits in addition to their behavior go? Maybe it's not even in this section. This is really code of conduct. It's not about invited speakers. It's not about additional people being added to the agenda. And, and let me just add to this, because it hap happens more and more frequently, and that is committees who want to present to the council. And the extent to which, you know, I mean, basically, you know, I have an exam example right now, uh, one of the committees, um, um, ECAC, uh, wants to present their annual report and they want to present their recommendations for the town council, for the town manager's uh, upcoming evaluation. And I've said five minutes here, five minutes there, and said either the September 11th or September 18th meeting. Now, I think I have the right to do that. Um, but if the council, through the rules of procedure, wants to also lay out um, guidance for the presiding officer about committees then also include that this is again this is maybe not even in this section thank you all right well it does seem to me we are talking about invited speakers uh and it there's a hop back in my mind to the human rights commission report and nothing happening with it so mm -hmm. I think that it, it is important to look at this and possibly look at it here. Mandy? I'm going to go all over the place on this. So item F in 6.1, I think actually belongs in 6.3. Um, well, or, or no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm uh, just. Yeah, no, or belongs. It, it refers to counselors. So it's yeah. not related to item 6.1 or it belongs up above, but. It, it's one where members of the public not hold private conversations. Well, that's an audience thing and they might be able to as long as they're not disruptive, right? So right. I don't think it belongs in 6.2 about audience conduct, but probably belongs in both 6.1 and 3, but reworded. Um, item D in 6.1 is just missing a period at the end of it. I think cell phones being silenced should apply to everyone. So I would delete it from 6.1 and keep it up above in the general... Mm -hmm six rules um, that are just out there. Um, my intention with this section 6.1 was that it applies to everyone that is not a counselor that is a participant in a meeting outside of public comment and to address um, outside of the general public comment period or the public comment period. I didn't know how to word that, but that was the question. The question becomes, and this was another thing I struggled with, can we combine 6.1 and 6.3 for anyone outside of that general public comment period who is in the meeting? Um, and we might be able to combine them for everyone, not just counselors. Um, we have council time limits. We can have presentation time limits for the presentation and then for the responses to questions, right? Um, all of that can be written in. It just depends on how far we want to go. Um, I'm fine with Lynn's suggestion of adding that um, the presiding officer needs to be informed of intended speakers outside of counselors for presentations. Um, whether that be staff members, which I figured included in this, or whether that be the situation we had with the um, specialized stretch code, um, where the counselor who proposed it had invited um, a member of ECAC to do the main presentation. I've done it myself with lighting presentations, right? You know, we all sometimes do it. We're not necessarily the expert. Can someone from the public do it? Um, I would agree the chair should have, the, the presiding mm -hmm. officer should have knowledge of that. Um, yeah. yeah, I agree. Jennifer, and then Athena. Yeah, I agree with what Mandy Lynn said. I would I would have assumed the presiding officer would know if there was a speaker <clears throat> outside the council. Um, but I do think that we should include committees here or someplace in the bylaw so that there's a um, there's a policy about committees making presentations or reports. So some <clears throat> there's not a feeling some are favored or given special treatment over others. 
No, you mean non-council committees? Yeah. Yes, non-council committees. Right, right. Maybe it needs to say something like non-council committee who wish to re uh, present their report publicly to the council or something like that um, should notify the speaker, the presiding officer in advance. I'm not... Request that from the presiding officer. Yeah. I, 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 don't, right. I do not want to open the door that every committee is going to come to the council and present. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there is already some assumption like that for lots of committees. But it would have to be, there would have to be some policy so every right. committee felt like they were being treated equal in their request. Right. Well, I, I remember in the very first year, I at one point tried to map every committee in the town to a council committee. Actually, Dorothy Pam and I tried to do that. And it was almost impossible mm -hmm. if I could find my notes. Athena? Um, that, that was an awkward situation that came up with the stretch code. I would say that it's the presiding officer who invites presenters. So without an invitation, you're a member of the public. And mm -hmm. you know, if you had asked me at that point in the meeting, I would have said, are you allowing everyone in the public to make a presentation or speak during this time? Because without that invitation, they're a member of the public. So, um, you know, if, if somebody had brought that up, it, I would have said that's out of order, but, <clears throat> and then I think you, you said something else and it's slipping my mind right now, but um, the, the, I, I, don't, I don't think that rule needs changing invited speakers that, the presiding officer is the one who's sending the invitation. So you would know, and it would be part of the meeting planning like you do now with everyone else. Um, just to add to that, it's interesting when we were all virtual, it was, you had to know because that person had to be sent an invitation. Right. Now that we're back mostly in the room, which I'm really enjoying all of us being there as many of us they can. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not as easily done. Somebody just can be in the audience and you don't even realize they're an invited speaker. But being in the audience doesn't make them an invited speaker. Absolutely not. I agree. Athena, do you have more? Maybe, but um go ahead. I, 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 my brain's not fully functional this morning. I've only had a couple of hours of sleep. So if it, if it comes back to me, I'll try and, I'll try and bring it up again, but not, not at the moment. Thanks. Mandy. Yeah. I would just request as we look at this for next time, the, the committee look to see whether 6.1 and 6.3 really are one and the same, um, okay. essentially where invited the invited people as and counselors should really just be one rule um because it might simplify the rules a little bit a, a lot of the stuff is double double written anyway right but i don't think we're ready to do that now but it's something as i was writing them that i was like could these be the same but i didn't want to make too many changes yeah. outside of the committee yeah. and talked about yeah and it, it yeah uh, was someone up before you, Lynn? I lost them if they were. Lynn? I don't think so. Um, the other topic I brought up was, you know, committees who say, oh, we'd like to come before the council. And generally, I've tried to just use my own discretion. Uh, but um, does the council want to provide guidance to the presiding officer on that. The charter has a has a section that um, covers how people request an agenda item. <clears throat> and then it's the president's discretion whether or not to place that on the agenda. Right. Okay. Thank you. 
if that if that request goes to the full council via email, it's still up to the presiding officer or the president whether you want to place that on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I must admit, I support the idea of combining six point one, the current six point one, or the yeah, <laughs> and six point three into one rule. Uh, because we are all talking about people who are in some way, whether it's a counselor or an invited speaker, are presenting during the uh, council meeting. Um, I think the publics should be a separate section, but should be very reflective of the same behavior that we are requiring of counselors. Um, and we should be required to have the same guidelines that the public has that there shouldn't be a distinction in how we can behave. Um, okay, keep going, Mandy. Are we? I think we're on to 6.2, um, which is audience conduct. This one has, you'll see a lot of red and all. Um, I, I created a new B. I think it is, or maybe it's part of A, I'm not sure, but where we're referencing, or we had created it during, um, I guess red, blue is me, right? Yes, so we referenced me. rule 5.1 regarding the rules for general public comment. Everything else in red, I guess, is what we talked about before I was tasked with trying to come up with something. I thought that was important to do that reference um, because we're removing the rules of public comment away from rule 6.2 and making clear that 6.2 is conduct during meetings, not the general public comment period. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's why the public comment focus on got moved over to rule five and deleted here to not confuse those two sections. Um, I think those are the only changes in 6.2 for audience conduct that we didn't discuss because I think all the red was discussed at meetings. I think that's true. I don't know whether we've all, there's an agreement about everything in red. This is like an endless uh, whirlpool. Um, so shall we move on? Yeah, I think that's all I did based on those discussions. You wanted something on 6.4. On 6.4, I found civility still in there, 6.4. Uh, let me hold on. Yeah. Uh, the president of residing officer shall preserve civility and order and may speak to. So uh, the word civility is anathema right now. So what do we mean there? I think we just delete the word civility and preserve, just preserve order. order. That's okay with me. Anybody else in there? I think we. I think that's what's legal now. So we. Yeah. Yeah. Not much choice. Okay. So, shall we move on? When? So, are we ready to go? Do we want to move into um, motions? Uh, it might be. It might be worth mentioning briefly that you know we took. We just talked about. Um, uh, civility during council discussion and so on and and how the president or presiding officer maintains civility during those discussions so you know engaging in personalities or, or ad hominem um, <laughs> comments no um i mean I, I guess a counselor could just call a point of order or the president could could interject at that point but um that hasn't been a practice. So without getting more specific in that rule, mm. I, I guess it's the council's, yeah, maybe I don't need to say anything, sorry. <laughs> no, I don't apologize. Pat, I have my hand up because okay. it's- I'm reading. reading, that's why I didn't see it. Yeah. Go ahead, Lynn. It's, it's 11.15, you still need to make public comment and I think we need to decide um, I have a hard stop at 1130. Okay. So uh, let's stop here. I think this is a good stopping place. Thank you, Lynn. And um, I see one person uh, in the attendees. And if that, that person would like 
um, before that. Mandy? Yeah, I just want to know. So it sounds like we're moving rules. Is that something that the, the committee wants done for a new draft of this for next time with, in other words, should I be redrafting and taking and combining rules 6.3 and 1 for next meeting? Yes. Athena, can you send me the document then? Sure thing. Thanks. And thank you, Mandy. Athena, so, would you send all, all I, of maybe us. other people? I send it to all of us. I, I'm just like, yeah. this yeah, is trying to find what bunch of changes. I just like to take a look at the whole thing again. Thank sure, you. I'll, I'll send it around and I'll add this edited draft to this meeting's packet. Thank, thank you me. very much. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to say that there is one person in the attendees and if they would like to make public now, a comment now, uh, I am calling the public comment period here. So um, I will wait a moment and give that person a chance to decide whether they'd like to speak or not. And again, it can be on any issue uh, that the GOL committee deals with, not necessarily what we're talking about right now. Okay. It does not look like uh, there is public comment today. Um, so I, I, Lynn has a hard stop. It's 1117 now. Um, I'm kind of open to adjourning the meeting. I think that we've done a lot of work so far this morning. Um, I'd love to hear if uh, there's an agreement about that or people want to use the last few minutes. I think I mentioned during, I think before we got started that the, the final draft of the draft minutes wasn't done, so. Right, yeah, yeah. So that'll be coming to us at our next meeting, yeah. Lynn? So just let me clarify, at our next meeting, um, we will have the bylaw. And my it's a question, will we have the bylaw? And we don't know yet. And now you're talking about the zoning proposal? Zoning bylaw. Yeah. Right. Because, yeah. Well, because we if also we're have... any further along, we'll move to the other bylaws uh, that you know have been resting out there for five years, four years. <laughs> And the third thing is we'll come back on the rules. Is that my understanding yes. of, the, yes. of that meeting? Thank you. So the only thing that got moved is the zoning proposal review. Jennifer? Um, if the zoning review, so I'm, if it, let's say it wasn't ready for our next meeting, would that would we then not have to have an April, an August 7th council meeting? I think there were two items on that agenda. The street lighting yeah. definitively on that agenda too. Yeah, there are, th there are three items on that agenda. Uh, one is the street lighting, and the other is I just looked at that this morning. Um, the other is leftover bylaws, which we may or may not be ready with, and until I know whether or not we are going to have the zoning bylaws at this point. We'll keep that meeting on the calendar. As president, I would be inclined to cancel that meeting if we don't have the bylaws. Okay. Michelle? Did we uh, do the finance committee appointment while I was gone or yep. that? Oh, okay. Who yeah. got appointed? <laughs> I don't know. Some strangers. <laughs> Bob Hegner and um, Matt Holloway were, were only there. two. There were yes. only those two. Two okay. openings and only yeah. two applicants. We put sent out. I think like I sent out eleven or eleven to thirteen um, emails to people who had previously said they were interested and got no response. So we made that decision. Thank I you. Think. Yeah, and we and they're good people, so it's great. Anything else? Well, I am going to call the meeting of the G um, GOL. Um, it, anyway, it's adjourned. <laughs> I want to say I want to say thanks to Mandy Joe for getting back yeah. in the bylaws and Pat for picking this back up again today. We've had a good discussion. Yeah. Yeah. 
really yeah. good discussion. But Thank you know, it's it, dealing I with- I appreciate the, it. <laughs> I, I must say working on these rules uh, is frustrating because we do all this work, it comes to the council and some of it gets passed, some of it doesn't and nobody follows them anyway. So, and I'm talking only about counselors right now, <laughs> not the general public. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Athena, thank you. And will you send me the link as usual? Yes, I will. Thank you. Jennifer, did you have anything else? No, I'm trying to sign off here. Okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.